Hi, everybody. Welcome to the ninth episode of the Dark Matter Knits podcast. It's May 10th, 2014, and today's theme is Adventure Time. <laughs> if any of you have, well, I suppose you don't even have to, need to have children, but if any of you have children between the ages of about mm, 7 and 45, <laughs> then you probably know about Adventure Time, which is sadly going off the air. One of my favorite shows. Too bad. But uh, lots of things to talk about today with Adventure Time. Um, and uh, just to, I'll give you a quick preview of what we're going to talk about, and then we'll start with some basic business. Um, the, the main thing that I want to talk about today is my upcoming trip. I've probably mentioned a little bit about this before, but, and some of you, if you know me already, uh, know some of the details of this, but I'm going on a trip to France and Italy this summer for five weeks. <laughs> I'm ridiculously excited about this. So um, I'm going to talk about what I'm going to take with me on my trip and what I'm planning to do while I'm there. Um, I'm also going to uh, talk a little bit about... Um, well, I mean, really, that's going to be the whole the whole focus of the episode. Uh, I have a lot of little businessy things to show you and some knitting to show you and uh, some things to catch you up on. And then I'll have a technique video at the end where I'll show you how to do a provisional cast on. I was trying to think of, you know, what kind of technique tied in with the theme of the adventure. And uh, there are quite a few things, but I thought a provisional, my favorite way of doing a provisional cast on might be a good thing to show you because... A uh, provisional cast-on is kind of like an invitation to adventure, broadly construed. <laughs> uh, because basically, a provisional cast-on kind of leaves your cast-on as, as live stitches, or you can easily make them live stitches so that they can then go off on their own direction. So I'm going to keep things fairly short today. I'm, I'm going to try to go back to the 20 to 25 minute-ish episode that I you know, originally intended to be doing when I first started this podcast. So first, a few pieces of business. Uh, first of all, thank you so much to the many of you who contacted me after the last episode, either to, um, you know, just to express your concern or to wish me well, or to uh, share your own experiences with uh, difficult mammograms, whether they, you know, came out well or not. And it was very encouraging and, and really kind of you to uh, to reach out to me. And I just wanted to let you know briefly, I don't want to belabor this anymore, but, um, you know, a lot of you did want, a, want an update. So I've uh, really nothing new has happened. I've, I've just, uh, my doctor wants me to see a radiologist that she works with to look over the results before I do anything else. So um, I'm not really that concerned about it anymore. Um, and, you know, I just don't know anything yet. So that's that. I have a lot of um, thank yous to give. Uh, <laughs> apparently, uh, when you look at your iTunes reviews for podcasts, there's this little button at the bottom that says more reviews that I have consistently been blind to. <laughs> so apparently there are quite a number of you who have left reviews that I have just not even, not even seen before. So uh, I have quite a list today of people to thank. Um, so these are people who have left reviews on iTunes about my podcast, and uh, and I really appreciate your kind words. Um, Venus Code, His Handmade, Strid8, uh, my fellow podcaster, Downseller Studio Jen, Lucia Knits, Lori7711, Mary Shu, Nagy Knitter, You Creek Cottage, and Zombie312. <laughs> I told you there were a lot. I was so embarrassed when I clicked on the button, and I, I was like, ooh, look, there's more! And then I saw it down at the bottom that it said more reviews and I clicked it again and then I there was, said there were more and I clicked it again. I was born before the age of the internet, okay? I remember being in elementary school and being taken on a field trip to go visit a computer that was the size of a building and had punch cards. <laughs> I am not, I, I am a, I'm a tourist in the land of the internet. 
but I try. Speaking of which, there is uh, an app. There's an app for everything. And now there is an app for something else. But this is a really cool one, and I wanted to tell you it has nothing to do with knitting, although you certainly could apply it to knitting context, but it is really cool. My brother-in-law told me about it, and, uh, and I wanted to tell you because it is incredibly fun to play with. Uh, it's called Adobe Voice, so it's put out by the same company that does um, probably the one that you are most familiar with if you don't do design is uh, Acrobat, the reader, PDF reader. Uh, they also do Photoshop, and uh, that's probably the other most familiar one. Um, Illustrator, uh, InDesign, a lot of, a lot of um, software for artists and designers. So, usually their software is incredibly expensive ask me how I know, but uh, they have just put out a free app called Adobe Voice, which is, uh, I know it's available for iPads. I am uncertain as to whether it is available on other platforms. Sorry, should have checked that. But what it does is, um, it's a little hard to describe, but if you've ever seen, uh, a lot of commercials are like this, uh, a lot of commercials on the web especially, there are these um, kind of icon-heavy um, little animated things where somebody is talking in the background there is usually a ukulele playing <laughs> a little ding 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 kind of tune and uh, and little icons come whizzing in as the person talks and they go whizzing off and little words and photographs and things just kind of go whizzing by you know what I'm talking about? well this app allows you to create those and uh, and I thought what a cool, I mean, you could use this for so many different things. This would be great for, if you hate PowerPoint, for example, which don't even get me started about PowerPoint. Uh, there's a whole series of books about how PowerPoint destroys the structure of arguments and is graphically the most pathetic piece of software ever created. But if you hate PowerPoint, <laughs> Adobe Voice is a much more fun way of putting together a, a kind of presentation and um, and you could use it uh, to create you know little promo things on YouTube I was thinking I have a book coming out not not too far in the future hopefully and um, and I'm thinking about doing like a little book promo video on there it's it's a lot of fun to play with and it's it's the interface is so simple that my nine-year-old immediately picked it up, like immediately figured out how to use it. I know nine-year-olds are better at these things than anybody else, right? But still, it's, uh, I was able to use it too. <laughs> so there's that. Uh, another little bit of business that I wanted to share with you is that uh, this shawl that you see here, uh, my Summer in Angers shawl, uh, which I, I showed you my knitted sample last time, this is actually my mom's that she kindly mailed to me. Uh, this shawl is, uh, as you may have seen, is on sale during its first two weeks of being on Ravelry. Um, so if you look up in the Summer in Angers shawl, it's Summer in A-N-G-E-R-S shawl. And uh, it is on sale for a dollar off until May 12th, which is two days from now. Um, if you would like to get such announcements from me sooner than every two weeks on the podcast, I have a mailing list that I link to every time in the show notes for this episode. So uh, you can get on my mailing list and you'll hear about all this stuff. Um, well, I send it a monthly newsletter, so you'll you know hear about these things in a more timely way. So I think that's all of my announcements. Uh, let's get into... I'm going to talk about what I've been knitting first before I get into the kind of meat of it. Um, I haven't really been knitting much. Well, I have been knitting a lot, but it's all in kind of in one category of fairly small and simple things, namely dishcloths. I'm, I'm, I think my anxiety is still kind of lingering because um, dishcloths are not something I normally knit, but for some reason I just suddenly had a hankering to knit washcloths. Uh, so... As I've mentioned, I work for Cooperative Press, and there is a series of books that we put out called, well, the author is Deb Buckingham, and they all have Dishcloth Diva in the title. This is her second book, Dishcloth Diva, and it's on. And um, 
so I knit a few dishcloths out of here. Actually, the first thing I did was I knit, a crocheted a few dishcloths because my son, um, it's Teacher Appreciation Week, so I've been doing some for them. So I did a couple of flower-shaped uh, washcloths for a couple of his teachers, and then I've been making a few more to, um, to give to other teachers. So there's this one, which is probably the simplest in the book, so it's great... Uh, you know, great TV knitting. It's called Olive, and I'll show you the picture in the book. That is Olive. And then I made, actually that was the second one I made. This is the first one. <laughs> yeah, isn't that cool? This one was really fun to knit. Uh, do make sure to check out, check the errata page on Ravelry because, um, we worked out that there was a mistake in this, but um, that is Lucille Bell. Whoa. And then I am currently knitting the pattern in the book that is called Elizabeth. Suitably enough. It has a very cool sort of nautical look. Um, and one of the things that the the book does that I like is um, she talks about how you can, um, you know, that up, you would typically work up a dishcloth in cotton, but um, she has a whole section in the back about uh, working up these squares in wool and putting them together into charity blankets and where you might send them and how you might do it as a community project. And uh, it's a nice, nice adjunct to the book. Uh, I have been knitting all of these in... Knit Picks Dishy. So this is my, oh no, it's not my first time knitting with this, but I really like it. It's a um, somewhat more souped up version of dishcloth cotton. Um, I think a little nicer than than the, the kinds that you can find in the typical craft stores. Um, and the colors are a little more, a little more sophisticated. So I've really been enjoying working with that. And I actually have done some spinning this week, which uh, I haven't done in a while. You might have noticed I haven't really mentioned it. Uh, this is what I had been working on the last time I showed you some spinning. This is from the, the woolen, wooden spinner, sorry, uh, Mississippi-based fiber producer and dyer. And it's a uh, merino silk combination that she does. These really cool bats that have... Um, these just blaps, noils of, of silk that run through them. And it, it was a little challenging for me actually to figure out how to manage those because they just kind of, sometimes they just emerge in these giant chunks. I mean, you can see right here, especially where they, uh, where they really just came out in these giant blaps. And I was trying to get the, the purple, this purplish blue, the wool to, you know, make enough of a, a wrap around it so that the silk just won't, you know, come, come tumbling out at some point. And I wasn't always successful at that. So I'm not sure how well those noils are going to hold inside the yarn. Um, hopefully the, the plying process will kind of help seal them in a little bit better. I'm actually going to ply this. This is a two ounce bat, I believe. And then, um, I have another two ounce bat that is light green that has uh, noils in similar colors to this. So I think it will look really cool applied together with this. So that is what I've been working on. I haven't really been knitting much this week. I've been doing a lot of, I've been working a lot. Um, working on all kinds of cool things. Uh, I'm trying to get as much work done for Cooperative Press before I leave on this very long trip because this is kind of a big push time of year for us. Um, we're trying to get out as as many books as we can over the summer so that when it comes time to go into shows, the big shows in the fall, uh, Rhinebeck, for example, we'll have lots of new books to put out on the tables. So, uh, and I won't really have much opportunity to do a lot of computer work while I'm in uh, while I'm in France and Italy. I'll, I'll have plenty of time to do 
some work. I won't really be entirely on vacation while I'm there. I can't really afford to do that. But um, I'll mostly be doing knitting design and um, some writing while I'm there. So segueing into that, I actually wasn't really even sure how much to talk about this because I kind of feel like this is the most obnoxiously luxurious experience to have that um, I feel like I'm making myself into a dartboard that you can then just throw darts at. <laughs> but here's the situation. Let's just pretend we're all happy for me, shall we? <laughs> uh, I... So my husband is uh, is a philosophy professor at St. Edward's University, which is a Catholic school here or college here in uh, in Austin. And uh, and like many universities, they have some of their own study abroad programs. And he applied to teach on one of these study abroad programs and got in for this year. So he is teaching a six week course in um, at the oh, what does UCO stand for? It's I can't remember. I, oh, it must be Université Catholique Occidentale, Catholic University of the West. I know is how it's and it's UCO. That's how it's uh, translated in English. Anyway, um, Saint Ed's and UCO have an exchange program where they uh, UCO sends students to Saint Ed's and vice versa, and Saint Ed's faculty takes students over uh, during the year during the summers to take classes there. So, uh, so he's teaching a six week program in Angers, which is why I named the shawl this summer in Angers. And, uh, that town is about two hours west of Paris. Actually, well, if you're driving, it's probably about two and a half hours. I think it's like an hour and a half on the TGV, which is the high speed train. Um, and it is on the Loire River. It's in the Loire Valley, uh, which is very agricultural region and uh, was uh, is, a, is an area that has lots of beautiful medieval chateaus and uh, you know kind of I haven't been there before but I kind of get the sense that it's uh, you know more slower paced and not necessarily rural but just you know more sparsely populated than uh, well certainly than Paris which is where mostly where I've been in France before. So um, I'm really excited about, I, I won't actually get to go for the whole time that my husband is there uh, because his program starts three weeks before my son finishes school. So as soon as my son is done with school, we're going to go join him. So we'll join him for the last half of the program, for the last three weeks. And then um, my parents are renting a house in Tuscany. <laughs> I know. For two weeks, which we, are, we can't go for the whole time, but we're going to be there with them for about 10 days. And, um, yeah, it's, I, I am just ridiculously excited. So here is my plan. Um, like I said, I can't really, as a freelancer especially, I can't afford to just pull myself out of the out of the work race for five entire weeks. That would just be insane. Um, however, I do not have a laptop, and I am also really not going to have large, uninterrupted stretches of work time where I can concentrate on computer work. So what I decided to do is really concentrate most of my work time there on knitting design, which I'm really, really excited about because uh, I haven't really devoted as much time to that in the last year, especially as I would have liked. Um, I think the issue is, I think the reason why I haven't done that is because uh, knitting design is, you know, in terms of making money for my business, is, um, is an uncertain quantity. Uh, I know if I put in an hour of work for Cooperative Press, I will be paid for that hour of work. Um, if I put in an hour of work on knitting design, the design might not get accepted by the magazine or the yarn company or whatever. Um, I might, If it's a self-published design, people might not really be that into it, and I might never even you know recoup my costs, let alone make any money off of it. So... Um, 
I guess I've, I've been a little bit uh, playing it a little bit safe in terms of my, my um, you know, trying to make income. But I think I'm really ready to just push, you know, to really try to get some stuff out there. And, um, and I was thinking, you know, I'm, I'm going to be in such a beautiful place and just kind of out of my usual context that, uh, that I think it would be a really inspirational, um, that it would be a great time to sort of draw inspiration for coming up with the new designs. So I'm actually taking probably a whole suitcase worth of yarn <laughs> and needles uh, so that I can really crank some stuff out while I'm there. I actually have a bunch of stuff that I've been, you know, I've got all the yarn, I've got the idea, and I just need to write it up and, and knit it up and just haven't taken the time to do it. So um, I've got some Anzula yarn that I've been meaning to knit up into a sweater. Um, I have some Knit Picks yarn, some, yeah, some Knit Picks yarn that I'm um, going to try to knit up into, or work up into a summer top. Um, I have, what was the other thing? Oh, I have some, um, I have this stuff that I got at DFW Fiberfest that I'm thinking about. Um, I want to do something different with a gradient yarn, kind of show how it can be used in different ways. I think that's about all I'm going to say about it right now, but um, I want to do something with that. And there was one more thing that I'm forgetting, but I have a lot, a lot on my plate that I want to go ahead and get done. So uh, really looking forward to having the time to do that. And I'm thinking about doing some writing while I'm there too. This is another thing that I've been neglecting. I love to write. I mean, I've, I have the same sort of agonies while actually writing that everybody else does, but, but I really, really enjoy writing and I think I'm pretty good at it and I ought to get back to it. So I'm putting together a proposal for an article for, for Ply Magazine um, for an upcoming issue. And I think I'd really, I want to write something about knitting culture in France and Italy, both maybe, or just France. I'm really curious to see if there are other knitters there. I mean, I understand from friends of mine who live in various parts of Europe that uh, that Europe hasn't necessarily seen the same kind of resurgence in knitting culture that uh, that the United States has seen. Now, I'm sure that's different in different parts of Europe, and in some you know, in some ways, I'm sure it just never went away. You know, the reason why it's made such a big comeback in the U.S. is partly because it um, it's not necessarily as much a part of daily life or hasn't been as it is in many parts of Europe. So I just want to know, like, do you see people knitting out in the streets? Do people just kind of wander around sitting outside doing it? Is it pretty common to be able to find yarn shops in small towns? I know there are, there's at least one in Alger. Um, I found a a blog post about it online and it's um it looks completely charming in fact the the woman who wrote about it said that it was her favorite of the yarn stores that she visited in in uh in northern france and uh it looks like if you've ever seen pictures uh in amsterdam or if you've ever been to amsterdam and you've seen those really narrow row houses they're they're, they're so narrow in fact that they had these little winches on top because you cannot get furniture up the, the narrow staircases. You have to lift it up and bring it in the windows. Uh, they're incredibly narrow, sometimes as narrow as, uh, you know, two and a half, three feet. Am I exaggerating? I'm probably exaggerating. I'm totally making this up. The last time I remember learning about this was on like a boat tour in Amsterdam when I was like 16. <laughs> so my memory is a little dim on the precise details. But anyway, this shop in Angers, looks about that narrow. Like there's pretty much room for a shelf on one side and the shelf on the other and a walkway in between. And you just, it's, you just like tunnel into yarn, like a mole. <laughs> it looks fabulous. And it's really hard to find. Um, there are a number of French yarn lines that are not easy to find in the U.S. Like uh, Annie Blatt is the one that comes to mind. Uh, so I'm really excited about, you know, seeing what kinds of yarns 
they're kind of hard to find here, I might be able to find there. Not really planning on doing a lot of yarn buying, but, uh, you know, just a few souvenirs. All right, I think that's going to be about it for me today. Uh, I hope it's, well, I think it's good for me to keep things a little short. Don't you? <laughs> um, like I said, I'm going to do a little uh, short technique bit here at the end, and otherwise I will see you in a couple of weeks. Oh, and I meant to mention, um, well, a few things, a couple of quick things. One of them is that I will record while I'm in France. I'm leaving on June 6th, and I'll be gone through July 16th. So I'm going to record while I'm there. I'm not sure I'm going to be able to post while I'm there. We'll have to see how that goes. Um, so I will at least, I'll let you know in the next episode. Well, I'll let you know on the, on the website what's happening one way or the other. And I also need to mention that you can find me online at darkmatternits.com. And on Ravelry, I'm Elizabeth GM, and there is a Dark Matter Knits group that you are most welcome to join. And uh, on Twitter and Instagram, I am Dark Matter Knits. All right, see you in a couple weeks. Bye. Or should I say, au revoir. So let's take a look at how to do a provisional cast on, or at least one way of doing it. When you do a provisional cast on, you're going to need some waste yarn. And typically I like to use a cotton yarn that is somewhere around the same weight as the yarn that I'm going to be using for the project. Uh, the reason why you might want to use cotton is because it is, it is fairly smooth and it is unlikely to leave uh, fuzzy bits in your project. And I'm going to, you don't necessarily have to do it in a contrasting color to your project yarn, but I'm going to do that just to make things a little easier to see. So the first step in a provisional cast on, or at least the kind that I'm going to show you today, is, and I'm going to do the type where you use a crochet hook. I know, I know, knitters, sometimes you don't like the crochet hooks, but you're going to have to get over your fear or your loathing or whatever it is. Crochet hooks are extremely useful. So we're going to make a crochet chain, which means just, well, here, <laughs> I started without telling you what I was doing. You're making a slip knot. We all know how to do that from casting on. Put a slip knot onto your crochet hook. I'm just going to hold the yarn in my left hand. Hook the yarn around the needle. So you see I just kind of swiveled the yarn around and pull a loop through. This is called doing a chain stitch. You're just making a little chain of stitches. Okay, so I just make a few chains and then I'm actually going to grab my knitting needle or one of the needles and I'm going to continue to chain over the needle. So if you see what I'm doing here, I'm actually putting the needle on top of the yarn, holding the crochet hook to the right and the yarn to the left. And I'm just going to keep chaining over the needle. Sorry, this is a little awkward to do on camera. And then pull the yarn back around to the back every time. Chain through. Pull the yarn around to the back. And see what's happening here is that I've now got stitches on the needle. Pull through, around to the back. And you keep doing this for as many times as you need stitches. You just cast on the number of stitches that you need. And just to kind of walk you through the steps of what I'm really doing here, holding the needle in my left hand and the yarn, the hook in my right, grabbing the yarn, pulling it through, and then I'm grabbing the needle with my right hand as I swivel the yarn around to the back, put the needle back in my left hand. Thought I should point out that little detail. All right, what I'm going to do is I'm going to continue to cast on a few more stitches, knit a few rows with the project yarn, and then I'm going to come back and show you how to unzip this cast on.
Be back in a sec. Actually, I need to show you one step before I knit a few rows. What you need to do here at the end, when you've got enough stitches, actually when you're one short of the number of stitches that you need. No, actually when you have enough stitches. So I'm going to do 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12. Let's say they told me to cast on 12 stitches. I'm going to stop there. I've got 12 on the needle. And then I'm just going to chain a few more stitches here at the end. Just so I don't have a, you know, a loose thing flopping around and then I'll just cut this and pull the yarn through. All right, be back in a second. Okay. So now I have worked up a little swatch here in that's emerged out of my provisional cast on. I just treated like that like a regular cast on and knit up from there. And at some point when you are working a project that requires a provisional cast on, they're going to tell you to go back and unzip those stitches and put them back on the needle. This part might even be bound off already. So here's how you go about doing that. You're just going to go back here to where the last spot where you were doing the chain stitches. So this is where you ended up and then you pulled the little so the last of your chain stitches, you pull the little end through. And I'm going to pull that little end back out so I can start unzipping those stitches. And I just kind of do it carefully, a little at a time. And actually, normally for this, I use a circular needle or maybe a double point if it's short enough, um, because that way I can just put these stitches on however I like and I can knit in either direction. But you just keep kind of popping these out carefully a little at a time, and you'll see. Let's see if I can get this to focus a little better. You'll see some little stitches, live stitches, starting to emerge here. There we go. As you pop these out, in fact, there's one right there. And if you use a different color, you can see them before you even have to pull the pull the yarn out. Give it a pull, and there, there's a little stitch. And if you want, you can even pop one in before you pull original cast on out. You just keep doing that all the way across. If you were using a really slippery yarn, you would want to do this very, very carefully. Otherwise, these stitches are going to run everywhere. This is a fairly sticky wool, so I'm not having to be overly meticulous about it. And then there's going to be one last little spot down here that's not really a stitch that you're just going to have to kind of pull the yarn out of. And now you've got stitches that can go off in the other direction. Now one interesting thing you're going to notice is that if you count these stitches 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 11, wait a minute, I thought I cast on 12 stitches. You did. The issue is that you're going in a different direction. So when you cast on the stitches, you were casting them on as V's going in this direction. You know, when you're knitting up, knitting up this way, your V's are, are right side up like this, right? You are now picking up the loops that are in between those stitches that you cast on. Which I know might be kind of hard to picture, but if you imagine 12 blocks in a row, there are 11 spaces between them. And you are effectively sort of picking up the loops in the spaces between those stitches that you cast on. So you're going to have one fewer. And uh, your pat different patterns will have different ways of accommodating that. They might just have you add a stitch on the first row to get sort of get back to 12. Um, but that is how you do a provisional cast on and how you unzip the stitches and get them back on.